Hello Scott. How are you doing? Well, good. Fine, fine, fine. Welcome to the Fireside Chat. Uh, this week shot from the top of uh, Wendy, the only working vehicle at Wild Earth right now. Uh, filmed by VM, who is looking very excited by the prospect. Um, as we carry on with the Fireside Chat, what we're going to do is we have to do quite a lot of preparation before we see you again, so that when we appear to you next time, it is as normal next to the fire. So what we're going to do is take you straight into one of our highlight clips from the week, and that is of two sub-adult hyenas behaving like Labradors released into a river. Um, astonishing behavior, some territorial stuff, some amazing swimming, and some fairly close encounters. Right, we're going to take you over to the clip now, and we'll see you just now. See you later. <laughs> this is unbelievable. I've never seen this before. Hello. It doesn't smell much better off there. Hi. Well. I've never had an adult hyena do that. It's just sub-adult, but having a great time frolicking in the water. <laughs> there we go. Tails up in greeting. Maybe they found something. That kind of, that tail up is a sign of excitement, it's also a sign of kind of threat or that they are marking territory or something the same, like that. <laughs> Hello everybody, <laughs> well, welcome again to the fireside chat and this time we're actually next to the fire, which is quite exciting. Um, Wonderful hyena interaction. You've seen the clip. What it do you is. think was going on there? It's hard to say. I think it was pure joy that those hyena were mm. showing us. They were, like James said, like two playful Labradors let out into a river. Great analogy. And I wonder what it is that got them so excited. Mm. I thought possibly the fresh water that was coming out of that pipe. Yeah. That's abnormal for them. So that kind of new new sort of thing to drink. Yeah. I mean, when we did spot them, Vim and I were, I think it was Vim and I, we were way below the dam wall. And, or not the dam wall, we were in the depression. And we just heard this tremendous splashing and initially thought it must be an elephant or something. And then we just saw the, the head of this exuberant hyena bobbing up and down. And then they did that very odd sort of uh, territorial thing where they flicked their tails up, which I, is always amusing to watch. And we went to look what they had been smelling and we couldn't find anything. So perhaps some other hyena had anal pasted. That's a really horrible thing to have to say on television. Uh, uh, anal pasted onto, I've said it again, on, onto, the, onto the ground. And that's perhaps what they were getting excited about. I'd say, would you say they were sub-adults? Yeah, they did look like sub-adults to yeah. me. Um, Another thing, I mean, possibly anal pasting, definitely like James says, but even if an animal had have simply walked there, mm. they, can, they can really pick up that smell. I remember once an incredible sighting in the Sabi Sands with a, a male cheetah, and it was in a massive open grassy clearing, and we lucky enough got to spend the afternoon with this cheetah. And it got up and moved several times in the course of the afternoon, get up, moved a couple of hundred meters, lay down. And because we followed it along this pathway, we knew exactly where it had moved. And later on in the afternoon, we saw a hyena that had picked up the cheetah's scent trail and literally step for step, it followed the exact path that the cheetah moved on to where it would lie down and then continue to get up until it found the cheetah that we were lying with. Now the hyena was hoping that the cheetah would have mm. made a kill, but there was no meat there. And interestingly enough, there's a twist in the tail because I told all of my guests, when the hyena gets here, it's going to see the cheetah, see that there's no meat, and carry on in a different direction. There's no need in getting caught up in a mm. confrontation. And those two species usually won't fight with one another, but the cheetah will always give in to the hyena. Mm. Even if there is meat, it's 90% yeah. of the time, 99 the cheetah would run off. In this case, though, the cheetah, even with no meat to protect, ran after the hyena, front legs out, and walloped Jeez. it on the bottom. So, 
Strange things do happen out here. And just an interesting sighting where I got shown yeah. firsthand how incredible hyena's sense of smell really is. Right, so maybe they were just following some other predator, perhaps. Um, just to keep you posted, uh, well, not to keep you posted, to answer a question from John. John in Atlanta, you're uh, totally off the topic of hyenas, and that's absolutely fine. That's what these fireside chats are for. You'd like to know who's been here the longest, and how long have we been at Juma? And as far as I can make out, it uh, the order goes as follows. Brian, and then VM, and then Scott, yeah. and then Andrew. Yep. And then Brent came along, and then Tara and Nikki, correct? Nikki, Nikki Tara. and Tara. And then I came quite a long time after that. So that's basically the order of it, John. And how long have we been at Juma? I think we've been there, uh, I think we've been here about nine months, if I'm not mistaken. Ten months. Sorry, I'm being waved at frantically out of the darkness by Brian, who's telling me that we are, in fact, have been here for ten months. And That's it's been it, a great ten, 10 months and what I'm really looking forward to is finishing the circle of mm. when we started late last summer, which is where we're really approaching now and we're going to get to see the full change of the seasons. Obviously there's been some incredible sightings and interactions and stories along the way, but to have that full cycle of one full year in the bush in the same location is something that I look forward to completing with all yeah. of you. I've always found that whenever you're in a wilderness area, to spend maybe just a year is not a long time at all. You know, the seasons change profoundly and the years change from year to year. So, I mean, since I've been in the Sabi Sands, we've had flood years, we've had drought years, we're in a very dry sort of spell now. So, to order, in order to fully understand a place, you really do need to spend quite a lot of time here. Exactly. And or especially from a guiding point of view, to know all the little sneaky alleys and the stories yeah. of what the animals have done. It's one thing hearing stories about what exactly has happened with certain prides or certain leopards over the years. But it's the best thing to experience it yourself and then know firsthand exactly what's been happening. Mm. Um, we are getting a few questions through and please send, keep sending them through. It is lovely to hear from you and we do appreciate it when you send stuff through to us. Um, we're also going to have a couple of looks at some of the leopards that we've seen this uh, week. Um, some tremendous highlights from the leopards and one of the, I think we've got three, three clips, correct? Yeah, three, three different, different leopards. leopards merged into uh, one clip. Three different fellows and what we would like you to do is let us know who do you think the most beautiful leopard is that we're going to see? I've no doubt that lots of you will be able to tell us who they are, but we're not going to tell you who they are, and you're going to have a look at them, and here they are. Please can you... you can see how cub-like his head still is. His face is still very cub-like. He doesn't have the severity that a big male leopard has. And definitely not only a firm favorite of all our viewers, but definitely a firm favorite of all of us from the Wild Earth team. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I must just tell you that I don't know who that is yet. We've just got here. Beautiful. Look how dark, look how golden he is. That's a young male. Saying that he has been seen more than just the one time with myself, and I'm told he was seen with a few scratches on him after a fight. But that must have been with another presenter while I was on leave. So a handful of times he's been seen. Not many though. And who knows, maybe it's a young male. Oh, look at that scar on his back. Is that not the scar that quarantine got? Did you see that? Obviously, each male will vary in size. Well, aren't we all so lucky to have Amazing. seen not one, not two, but three different male leopards this week. Interestingly enough, I'm sure some of you have been able to actually determine who is who, but yeah. one of them was a one-year-old, Sindile. Another one was Makombo, who's approaching two years of age. And the third was the quarantine male, 
which was three years of age. Now that isn't in the right order necessarily and keep sending through your votes as to which one you think is the most beautiful or your favorite, the first, the second or the third one that was shown and that way we can, you know, award one yes. of them leopard of the week leopard of the week they're all very beautiful and we're not going to get into the argument of who's more beautiful i've got myself into trouble like that a few times before so sorry about that um but what i think is quite interesting that we're not going to tell you who they were but sindile for me is uh, my favorite at the moment because as i arrived um, he was sort of the youngest leopard and the, one of the first leopards that I saw here and I really enjoyed spending an extended period with him. And I think for you, Scott, you had an extended period with quarantine when you first got here. Exactly. It's really interesting how things have changed with the leopard dynamics over the last few months. And like James says, in the earlier months over January, Dece or uh, November, December and January, we spent the majority of our time with the two brothers, quarantine and Kunyuma. Quarantine was probably my favorite because he was just so relaxed with the vehicle. Although Kunyuma could be really playful sometimes too, but he had this funny dark side about him where he would often snarl at the vehicles and slink off into thick bush, making our lives difficult to follow him. But I think a big reason why you do fall in love with these animals is that we are so spoilt in the amount yeah. of time we get to spend with them and really get to understand them and not become friends with them, but because we do yeah. spend so much time with them, you kind of feel like you've created this bond that not necessarily is there, but yeah. it's an imaginary bond. Especially, it is an imaginary bond, and it's, it's, it, we do well to, to remember that. So, the, it's, it's really impressive, uh, not impressive, it's really important that the time that we spend with them is um, not some sort of, con not confused with developing a bond like you might with a domestic animal. But, that said, a young male leopard is the most fun to be around. When they're little, between sort of Sandile's age and up to sort of Makombo's age, quarantine's now beyond that. He's not, um, if you look at Sandile's face, he's got a, a kind of gentleness about him that only comes with the youth. And quarantine is now beyond that. He's into adulthood, he's definitely not very big yet, but he will get bigger, I'm sure, like his father. Mvula, who's not enormous, but he's certainly much bigger than Sindile is. And Sindile has still got that young face, which I think uh, even more encourages us to form those kind of almost fake bonds. And then, um, of course, we've had a lovely bit of action by the waterhole this week, uh, in fact yesterday. And the major action there, of course, was that we were trying to test out a, uh, a drone. And a drone, for those of you who don't know, is some sort of a, a helicopter with four propellers on it. And those four propellers all have to rotate at the same time in order for the drone to remain airborne. Now yesterday we were uh, landing it, or so bringing it down over Gauri waterhole where there are a whole lot of catfish. And I said to Graham, who was running it, I said, let's see if you can see the whiskers of the catfish. And he, of course, took that as a challenge and uh, started to descend towards the mud. And lo and behold, one of the crucial components, i.e. one of the four props, fluttered peacefully off into the wind and not so peacefully the drone crashed down into the waterhole and that Teresa is what happened to the drone we then of course spend an extended and rather amusing period of fossicking in the mud like catfish until eventually Graham pulled out the hapless drone uh, we have the bad news to report that the drone while functional uh, no longer has a camera that is functional and the clever makers of these drones only sell the complete package so it would have to be replaced almost in its entirety and just to also remind you, sorry, I forgot to say, Steph and Jamie, of course, have also been here a while. But Steph, Jamie's been here, got here just after me. And Steph, I think, sort of on and off before and after me. Yeah, Steph yeah. has been on and off before and after. And they're both on sort of a little bit of leave at the moment. So that's perhaps why I, I forgot about them. Sorry about that, Steph and Jamie. And... On the topic of waterholes, we have, and leopards, I guess, prior to that, we've got a question through from Donna. Hello and welcome around the campfire with us. Donna's interested to know, why do leopards go down to waterholes? Are there ulterior motives for them going there? Is it just for drinking or possibly feeding? And 99% of the time, leopards will hang around waterholes simply for drinking, 
but may linger around in the no knowledge that prey animals could come to drink at those waterholes where they could lie in ambush. And I guess at this time of the year, for a short period of time, they may actively go to waterholes mm. to try and scoop out those catfish that we've been yeah. looking at. And it's something that I've never actually seen happen, yeah. but I have seen lots of footage and heard lots of stories about other guides seeing leopard hunt for catfish. Yeah. That's something we can look forward to happening. I think the reason maybe we haven't seen it, I mean, you've been in there to try and uh, get a fish yourself. Uh, the mud is extremely thick and it looks quite solid around the water, but it's really not. And I think a leopard at this stage in those particular water holes would sink right in. And I'm sure that's what's saving the catfish from those uh, from the leopards and what's interesting also is that yesterday while we were in there trying to you know move amongst the catfish I stepped into mud say about that deep and I found a catfish where my foot hit the solid ground so they're right under the mud they're mm -hmm. not only just on the surface there and I suppose that's where they'll reside when it gets dry won't yep. they? they'll be in that kind of thick wet mud and another good point that James brought up there is that Essentially, leopards don't like getting their feet wet. Yes. If they didn't mind, they would go straight into that mud after a very easy meal. Mm. And all of the cats in Africa don't like water. Yeah. Cheetah, lion and leopard will not go into the water unless they have to cross a river. Or, yeah, basically yeah. that's the only reason to get from A to B. Mm. But they will never do it to cool down like the tigers in India would and like the hyena in this area would comfortably do, just like the one you saw playing around with James. And that's not to say that, I mean, they're pretty accomplished swimmers. Most of our cats, especially the leopards, are, are very good swimmers. Exactly. Um, we got a couple of answers on who's who of the male leopards here. And Bugsy and Angie, you've both, uh, I think, got it correctly. Bugsy, you said that Mkombo was the last one, and you, that was your favorite. And Charlie, you got one, two, and three correct. One, of course, was Sindile, two was Quarantine, and three was Mkombo. So, very well done. I was not vaguely surprised that you got them right. I do think that the um, the ability of our viewers to identify the animals here is quite astonishing. I mean, it's it's definitely better than my ability right now. Right, but overall it would seem that Sindile was the favorite and I think that that's wonderful. Exactly, no surprises favorite. there. No. And I promise you that's got a lot to do with that young face that he's got and of course the rather um, difficult time that he's having and the unfolding story of his life. Right, so from leopards to the largest cats that we have here, uh, we have some interesting lion dynamics going on at the moment. The Birmingham Five males came onto the property two days ago and they murdered a buffalo, probably the sick one that was in Gauri Dam. And so we're going to show you a little clip of that and then we'll have a little discussion around the Birmingham lions and their, um, well, their takeover. Unbelievable to have heard those lions screaming like they were at that kill was just very very special and they are in the midst of taking this territory from the Matimbas and I think we're all in agreement while blood has not been shed yet it may still be shed but I don't think we're under any illusions as to what the outcome there will be. Exactly, and like James says, that's their main focus at the moment. Obviously, it's very important for them to feed themselves, 
but they are going to be hugely driven to try and overthrow and continue to maraud through this area, stamping their authority. And we can help answer Adrien's question, who has been interested to know why would they abandon this carcass there's still so much meat on it and you're right it's such bizarre behavior from lion but we have got in this very unique stage with the pride takeover where strange things will happen and because they feel that they had enough food in their bellies they could abandon that buffalo catch another one another day and head south to continue chasing and confronting the matimbas yeah, and I think they were, I mean, they were roaring all the way around the dam until probably about 11 o'clock last night. And then we just heard the roars starting to move further and further and further south. And we tracked them south across the boundary today. We know the Matimbas have headed into Malamala, which is south of us, mm -hmm. or two farms south of us. And so that's definitely, I think, why they left that kill. Exactly. Yeah. There's a strong chance they could have heard the Matimba males calling and thought, no, 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 we're not going to accept this. We're going to leave our kill and go tell these Matimba boys that we are on the way and we're in the area and we mean business. Yeah. And then a nice question from Sarah. Why is there nothing else feeding on the carcass? Well, I mean, the vultures are certainly having a go. They've eaten what they can. I think the interesting thing is why are the hyenas not eating it? And especially as it's so close to their den. Sarah, I don't have a real answer for you other than to say that the buffalo was quite emaciated and if you look at the four quarters which you can definitely see in that clip that we saw there's not a lot of meat on them um, I can only think that the, it's tough and leathery and all of the good bits basically all the organs are definitely gone probably quite a lot of the hind quarters I haven't been around the side have you no so I don't know how much of the hind quarters have been taken but I think probably quite a lot of them and over the course of time, as the skin softens in the sun, it will eventually become easier to tear. Uh, I think the hyenas will go back there and they will eat there. Difficult to say why they haven't descended in numbers because it is now smelling, of course, like the bowels of hell. And so there's no reason for them not to know that it's there. So why they haven't had a go at it, I really couldn't say. Do you not think it's got something to do with the, the, the vegetation in that area? Yeah. It's so, so thick. That imagine if you're a hyena and you're walking around eye level in this thick bush without a vantage point like us standing up or in the vehicle. You don't know where those big male lions are, yeah. but you can smell them. So you're going to be very, very skeptical to go in there. And like Brent said with his sighting this morning, there was a hyena and it was literally looking, trying to work out, are the lions still here? And it couldn't pluck up the courage to actually go in and feed on that kill. But I think tonight will be different. That's just my thoughts, but we'll have to wait till the morning to mm. find out whether or not they are in fact going to go in to finish off that mm. kill. I think that's actually a bril brilliant thought. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about that. Right, so that's their wildlife highlight for the week. And then a quick question from Christine, who would like us to perhaps show her some traditional African dancing to go with the music uh, that we sing in the evenings. Well, Christine, um, we could try it, but I don't think we'd be very good at it. And I, I'm always quite reticent to do that unless I'm with, say, a Zulu person who's teaching me to dance. Because I'm certainly, I mean, I've done a little bit of Zulu dancing, but I'm certainly not an expert at it. And yes, I'll do it at a party or so. But to perform it, I really think that you need to know what you're doing. And we've certainly got some Shangan dancers around here. Maybe one day we'll bring them along. But I'm not going to... Um, I don't think I'm going to put myself quite out there that much, yeah. Christine. Right, um, we do have a song this evening, and I'm not alone this evening. Oh, no. There is a surprise there in store surprise. for everyone. And I went and got myself an instrument. I'm only joking. This is an instrument that James acquired for yes, me. Yes, at great expense. Yes. So I am now officially on trial to become a member of his band. Yes. Scott will now so play under... the, the bucket, a.k.a. the drum. And this... <laughs> I must just tell you that this is Scott's world premiere on a musical instrument. Uh, well, no, he did make probably one premiere as a six-year-old on a recorder, perhaps. Yes, and I, do, I was on backup vocals, but that's not an there instrument. We go. So. Okay, well, it is, but I mean, this is your first major instrument, of course, and first live performance. Now, that's very good. That's a good start. There you go. We have not practiced this. Um, I know the song. Scott doesn't know what I'm going to play. It's called Umfazi Umdala, a wonderful song by Juluga from way back in the 70s 
and the words go how can you hit that child who's so young you old woman it's an old man chastising his cantankerous old wife and Zokulula means I will set you free. There's no word for divorce as far as I know in the Zulu language and so what he says to her is I'm going to set you free if you're not very careful. So here we go. The Umfaz Umdala, James Henry on guitar and Scott Dyson on the bucket. <laughs> Wherever you might be in the world. See you tomorrow.